guys, it's so good to be here. It's always a privilege to get a chance to preach the Word of God. Um, before we get into it, please join with me in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that uh, we get this chance to hear your word. Thank you, God Almighty, that uh, we're your family, that we come to humble ourselves and to sit at your feet and to hear the words that have the power to transform our lives so we can be ever more made into the likeness of Jesus Christ, your Son. I do pray now this time that you speak to each one of us individually. I pray that you speak the words that each one of us needs to hear to inspire us, to encourage us, to inform us, to correct us, to rebuke us, to train us, oh God, so we can be your people in this generation that turn it upside down for you. Uh, bless this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, um, all of this week I was thinking about what to preach for our regional service here in uh, San Francisco. And I, I had a couple of ideas I had in my mind. And then I was talking with uh, Christian Enos, and he shared with me how Jason's advice to him and to Ole, who are preaching uh, basically right now for the Silicon Valley and San Jose region, respectively, was that they pick a parable of Jesus and they preach it. And so I was like, you know what? Let me imitate. So I basically threw out all the notes, all the thoughts I was having, and I was like, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pick a parable of Jesus and we'll preach that today. And so today, I, I decided that we would preach on the parable of the shrewd manager. Oh, yeah. Go with me to Luke 16. Oh, wow. no way. As I was studying out Luke 16 and the parable of the shrewd manager, I was like, it's super interesting because this is one of Jesus' least taught least read, least preached parables. Uh, I think when, you, when people think about the many parables of Jesus, uh, many of them come to mind. But this isn't one of the first ones that people think about. And so I was like, why don't we just take a crack at it? Why don't we just preach it today at church? Uh, so today we're going to talk about the parable of the shrewd manager. Luke chapter 16. In verse 1, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Wow. This parable begins by saying that Jesus was talking to his disciples. And so that's our first clue in trying to break it down and understand what Jesus meant by this parable. We know for a fact, according to verse 1, that he was speaking specifically to his disciples. He was speaking specifically to those men who had left everything behind to follow him, to become his disciples, to become his students, so that he could teach and train them to be fishers of men. These were the men who had made a decision that there was no other purpose in their lives than to be followers of Jesus who would be trained to go seek and to save the lost. And this is a group of men that he's speaking to. The group of men who have already made a decision that they are willing to follow Jesus even to the death. So he tells them this parable. He says, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of mismanaging his work. And so the master calls in this manager and he says, what is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management because you can no longer be my manager anymore. The guy is shocked. He's scared. And he thinks to himself, my job is about to be taken away from me. What am I going to do? I've worked here so long that I no longer have the strength of a young man to go and dig ditches. I don't have the strength to go work menial labor. 
but I'm too ashamed. I'm too proud to actually go and beg others for my daily bread. So he comes up with an ingenious idea. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call in all of my master's debtors, and I'm going to ask them how much they owe my master. And I'm going to write off their debts. That way, when my master actually fires me, these people whose debts I have written off will welcome me into their homes. And Jesus says, the master commends this dishonest manager. Why? Because the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the lights. Wow. Jesus uses this parable as an admonition for his disciples. He's saying the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their kind than you guys. You guys need to be as shrewd as this dishonest manager was. Now, of course, the thing that confuses people is that the assumption is that, is Jesus complimenting this dishonest manager? Is Jesus telling his disciples to imitate the dishonesty of the manager? No. What Jesus is commanding and admonishing his disciples to do is to imitate the shrewdness of the manager. The word shrewd is defined as somebody who has a sharp powers of judgment. A shrewd person is someone who's astute, a person who is wise, a person who is intelligent, a person who is clever. What Jesus is telling his disciples is, you guys need to sharpen up. You guys need to get wise. You guys need to get intelligent. You guys need to have better powers of judgment. Let's break down the parables. As in all of Jesus' parables, the master represents God. Right. Yeah. And so if the master is God, the manager would be the disciples. Right. It would be every single person who is a disciple who is working for God. Right. And then the master's debtors, the people who owe the master money, are people who are in debt to God mm. as a result of their sins. Right. Come on. Yeah. It's like what the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3. So, chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Wow. What we owe God as a result of our sin, as a result of us making a decision to live our lives to ourselves, is a debt that we cannot pay wow. except with our own lives. Wow. And so, this manager in the parable calls in his master's debtors, the people who owe him money, and he strikes out their debts so that they can go forth and they can be free of their debt. Wow. That is what the disciples are supposed to do. That is the job of a disciple. A disciple is somebody who is trying to obtain debt forgiveness for sinners. Every human being on this planet is in debt to God. The disciple, the manager, is the one who God is hoping is shrewd enough to know that the time is short. Because that's what happens to this dishonest and shrewd manager. It says, very soon... My job is going to be taken away from me. Wow. At some point, my master is going to come and ask me to give an account of my management. Wow. There's a time going to come when every single one of us in this room is going to give God an account right. of what you've done with your life. Wow. There's a time going to come when you and I are going to stand before God and we're going to give him an account of how we've managed our lives, how we manage our talents, how we manage our relationships, how we manage the gift of eternal life that he handed on to us. Wow. And on that day, he's going to ask, did you cancel anybody else's debts? Did you take away anybody else's sin? Wow. As you and I know, you and I have zero power to take away anybody's sin, anybody's debt. That's what the manager did. He had no power to cancel the debt because he's not the master. But on behalf of the master, he cancels the debt. That's what you and I do. The price for the debt of our sins has already been paid by Jesus. I have no power to die on the cross for anybody. But I have every power to go and tell somebody, your debt has been paid. You no longer need to live in sin. You can actually live a free life that's freed because of the blood of Jesus upon you. The admonition of Jesus is, you guys better sharpen up because time is short. A time is going to come when your life right now is going to be required of you. It might even happen tonight. And 
how are you going to respond to God? Now the question comes, okay, so what about this is dishonest? What about this is Jesus asking us to imitate if this guy is dishonest? Well, when you and I actually help people to cancel their debt before God, it's a great thing. It's the grace of God, yes. But what we're doing is we're circumventing justice. Once again, the Bible tells us in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. What you and I have earned because of our sin is death. So, for instance, in San Francisco, the minimum wage is what? $14? $15. $15. $15. So, if I do two hours of work, I am owed $30. It's not a gift. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. I worked for it. It has to be given to me. So much that if my boss refuses to give me that $30, I can go to court and that boss is out of a job. The state of California is going to hold him accountable until he pays me the $30. Justice demands that you and I need to perish in hell because of our sins. We have done the deed. We've committed the crime. It is time to do the time. But as disciples, we circumvent justice. We come and we tell people, you are deserving of death and hell. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus, I'm canceling the debt. You're not going to do time for the crime you committed. We're circumventing justice. In the face of justice, we're dishonest people. Honesty demands if somebody has done the crime, you got to do the time. And Jesus says, the people in this world, they're more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. He's trying to tell his disciples, and he's trying to tell us in this room today, we need to wake up. Time is running out. You need to help people cancel their debt. Why? So that when this is all said and done, you'll be welcomed to eternal dwellings. Wow. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 <coughs> Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, But brothers, when we're torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown, in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Philippians chapter 4. In verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Yes. Yes. Paul says again, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You ourselves are a letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. Paul says our joy, our crown, our, our, our treasure that we're going to stand before God with is the souls of every man and woman that you and I rescued from the flames of hell. Our joy, our crown, the treasure we're going to glory before God with is every single person that we canceled their debt of sin and rescued them from hell. That is how we stand before God, all the souls that we rescued. And so, Paul would have us understand, just like Jesus would, that if you don't win souls, you're not being shrewd. You're not being clever. You're not showing sharp powers of judgment. You're not being wise. Wow. Our first point, win friends to gain eternal dwellings. What Jesus is demanding of his disciples there in Luke 16 is that if they are going to be welcomed into eternal dwellings, it's going to depend on what they do with their discipleship. How many people whose sins you're scrapping out 
you're writing out. How many people's debts you're canceling. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus tells his disciples, Behold, I'm sending you guys out like sheep amongst wolves. Be shrewd as snakes, but as innocent as doves. Jesus' admonition to his disciples once again was, Guys, you are my representatives, my ambassadors here in this world. And I'm sending you to an evil, dark world that's ruled by Satan. Satan reigns supreme in this universe. The only way that as sheep among wolves you're going to survive, the only way you're going to make it through the times of trial, the times of temptation, the only way you're going to survive this dark world and make it to eternal dwellings is if you're as shrewd as a serpent. But keep your hands as innocent as a dove. We're family here, so I have to get open. Yesterday I was uh, babysitting Mickey. And uh, for those of you who are visiting, Mickey is the five-year-old son of our lead evangelist, Jason Dimitri. And um, I was kind of waiting for Ashley and the sisters to come by so I could kind of like leave and go do a Bible study. And to kind of keep him entertained, I was like, hey, let's play Uno. So he goes and he brings the cards and we start playing Uno. <clears throat> and in my heart, I'm like, hey, dude, let me entertain the kids, so let's play Uno. So like, you know, I'm kind of like dreaming up schemes in my mind how like, you know, let's draw this thing out and stuff like that. <laughs> He beat me. <laughs> no joke. For real. And I was like, whoa. That kind of really hit my pride hardcore. My, my competitive pride came out. I was like, dude, he's a five-year-old kid. He just learned how to match colors and numbers. Like, dude, I went to college. <laughs> so I was like, hey, Mickey, you want to play again? He's like, yeah. And so he kind of like deals the cards. And this time I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm a deal, so. And we play. He beats me again, two times. And I'm like, dude, like, I'm bordering sin right now with what I'm feeling towards this little boy. Like, <laughs> I was like, hey, Mickey, let's play again. Let's play. Let's play. And he was like, well, I mean, this is the last time. I gotta go watch my movie. <laughs> he was watching Peter Pan. I had him pause it. I had him pause Peter Pan. Just so he could play with me. We play a third time, and to my shame, he beat me again. Three times. I was like, dude, no. Wow! I was like, nobody can know about this. So I was like, hey, Nikki, let's play one more time. And so he comes, I deal the cards, and I'm like, I'm watching him. I'm like, even like peering over his shoulder to see what cards he has. And I beat him. And I'm like, feeling good about myself in a weird way. I'm feeling good about myself in a weird way, but I'm like, dude, they can't beat me three times to one. Like, come on. Seriously. So I was like, you know what? Your mom doesn't like you watching movies for that long. I mean... It's not good for your eyes, so let's play. And so we played again, and then this time I beat him. And I'm like, it's three to two. At this point, he's bored. It's like, dude, I mean, this is not fun anymore. You're not up to my level. But what it hit me was the way Mickey was playing was he was just trying to get rid of his cards. Whatever card he had, he was just getting rid of it. Here I was, trying to beat a five-year-old kid with a complicated strategy. I, I saw I had like uh, the swap decks in there, so I put it in there. I had like uh, the, the pick two, so I kind of, I was lining them up so that, yeah, so I could get them. So that I'm like, oh, reverse, oh, reverse, oh, reverse. I'm like planning this big scheme. And the little kid, innocent as a dove as he is, he's super shrewd. He's like... The aim of the game is to get rid of your cards faster than the other one. So he's just matching the colors and the numbers. He's just going. He's just going. And I'm just getting ready. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get him. And every time I did that, he beats me. I'm like, this kid is looking at me and he's like, dude, sharpen up. You better get shrewd. And I'm like, I feel like that's how Jesus was looking at his disciples there in Luke 16. He's like, guys, even the people in this world who don't have salvation, 
Even the people in this world who all they have to look forward to is maybe retirement with a fat 401k so maybe they can go on vacation. The people in this world who have nothing beyond this life, they're working hard to ensure that when their jobs are gone, they're working hard to ensure that when they graduate college, that they have a good life. How much more you who have promised eternal life with Jesus? Says you better get shrewd. You better sharpen up. It's a reason why uh, uh, we're so proud of Nate and Sam. Yeah. <laughs> like everybody knows, Nate and Sam got engaged uh, uh, earlier this week. But uh, uh, Nate and Sam have been called by God to go in December to assume the leadership of our sister church in Eugene, Oregon. <laughs> And what they're going to go do there is what Jesus is admonishing his disciples to do. They're going to go there and win friends, win the souls of men, so they can gain eternal dwellings. They're not going to go to Eugene because it's like the most hip and happening spot on the planet today. They're not going to Eugene, Oregon because all their family lives there and they're going to have cheap rental. No, 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 no. They're going there because they're going to win souls for God. Just like Jesus says, so that they can gain eternal dwellings. They're going to go there and they're going to work hard, pouring their souls into people, pouring their lives into people so they can cancel their debts. So that one day when God comes and he asks them to show an account of their management, they can look Jesus square in the face and say, Jesus, here we are and here are the souls from Eugene, Oregon that we have brought to you. These are the souls that we harvested for you. Wow. We were shrewd. We actually spent our lives trying to make you happy. Oh. Win souls so you can gain eternal dwellings. Yeah. Our second point. Build God's house to gain the master's trust. Let's go back to Luke 16. Luke 16. In verse 10, Jesus says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. So we continue. Jesus is continuing to admonish his disciples. And he says to them, guys, whoever can be trusted with very little, you can be trusted with very much more. If you are dishonest with the little that God has given you, this little life he's given you, then you will be dishonest when he actually attempts to give you true riches, when he attempts to give you true salvation. So he says, if you have not proven trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? As he's speaking to his disciples, and as he's telling them, guys, at some point you're going to give an account to God, so be shrewd. He's like, if you guys are not trustworthy with your master's property, then there'll be no one to give you property of your own. The property of the master, the property of God, are the souls of men. If you and I, as his disciples, as his ambassadors, don't prove trustworthy in handling it, then he will not give us true riches. He will not give us eternal life for us to enjoy. What he's saying is, our first point, yes, you got to win friends. you got to win souls to gain access to eternal dwellings. But number two, we actually have to build God's house while we're here. That is how we gain the master's trust. I'm super fired up that we have the GLC coming here in two weeks. And the GLC, the Global Leadership Conference, is not just for, in quote, the leaders. It's not just for people who are in the full-time ministry or people who are planning to go into full-time ministry or people who are training for the full-time ministry. No, the Global Leadership Conference is a conference designed to equip and to help train anybody who would want to lead somebody to Christ, yeah. Come on. period. Come on. It's designed for anybody who, just like Jesus, wants to save souls and lead thousands upon thousands of souls 
into eternal dwellings. Come on, bro. That's why we have the Global Leadership Conference. Yeah. And so for each and every single one of us, God is expecting us to prove trustworthy in handling his property, our own souls, and the souls of everybody we come into contact with. Right. And in order to prove trustworthy, in order to gain the master's trust, I got to learn and train to be as effective as I can yeah. to save souls. Right. Whatever learning I need to get, I need to go after it. Whatever I need to study or imitate from somebody who's a little bit more effective than I am in soul winning, that's what you do. Yeah. That's how you show yourself shoot. Come on, bro. Guys, it's incredible to see the forceful advancement that God is bringing our way here in this congregation. It's incredible to think that uh, in the whole month of July, we had 10 additions. Yeah. And in this first week of August, just today alone, we're seeing six additions in the church here today. That is forceful advancement. That is what God wants. More and more souls coming into his kingdom. Right. But when they come in here, he's entrusting them to you and I. It's our job to shepherd them and make sure that whenever it is that Jesus comes back again to settle accounts with all of us, that they are all ready and willing to meet their maker, right. saying, here we are, right. ready to be admitted into eternal dwellings. Come on, Come on, whatever I need to learn, whatever I need to do to humble myself yeah. so I can take care of the souls of my brothers and my sisters, yeah. truly being my brother and my sister's keeper, yeah. I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Awesome. because God is watching. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know that the souls of men and women in my own soul are at stake, it's like I have to get up every morning and I have to have a quiet time. Oh, yes. Because not only is my soul on the line, but the souls of everybody that I'm going to preach to, the soul of everybody I'm going to share my faith with, the soul of anybody I'm going to sit down and study the Bible with is on the line. Yeah. I have to prove trustworthy. Mm -hmm. But it's not just for me. The admonition, as you see, is to all the disciples of Jesus. Yeah. It's for every single one of us. So now it's even more important to make sure that we're actually being spiritual every single day. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're going to settle accounts with God one day. Yeah. But the Pharisees, who are the religious leaders of that day, they will be here what Jesus is sharing with his uh, disciples. And they're not too happy with it. It says they're sneering at him. It's like, dude, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. And that really pricks their conscience. Because in the first century, the Pharisees, who are supposed to be the religious leaders, they're supposed to be the people who have been entrusted with the souls of the Jewish nation, they were not leading the people to Christ or to God for their salvation. They were only interested in the financial gains that they were going to get for themselves. Wow. You can study it out in Matthew 15. But Jesus actually rebukes them for coming up with customs and traditions that was only going to benefit them financially and was not going to help anybody else get close to God. You can study out Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus admonishes and rebukes the Pharisees. And he says, dude, you guys travel over land and sea to make a single convert for the financial benefits it's going to bring to you. But you make him twice as much a son of hell just as you are. That is the same rebuke Jesus will give us if we don't prove trustworthy wow. in handling the property of the master. That's where the dishonesty of the dishonest manager comes in. He had been dishonest. He was doing it for himself. And he had no concern for his master. When you and I as disciples live for ourselves... We're only concerned about our own salvation. We're only concerned about our financial peace or benefits. We're being dishonest with the property that God has given to us. Wow. This admonition that even Jesus extends to the Pharisees is something that God had been teaching his people for thousands of years. Go with me to the book of Haggai, chapter 1. Haggai, chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. Haggai was an old prophet who had gone back to the city of Jerusalem with the exiles who had returned. Like uh, Matt shared about a little bit uh, in his uh, contribution lesson. So obviously, the edict is given 
and the Jews are allowed to return from Babylon from their captivity after 70 years to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of God. Now, these exiles go back full of joy, full of excitement that they are being allowed by the sovereign God to go back and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple of God. But this is what God says to them through the prophet Haggai once they get there to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Haggai chapter 1, in verse 7. Sorry, in verse 5. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. This is incredible. These are the exiles who have made a decision to leave their lives in Babylon. To leave every career, every job that they've been working for the last 70 years for. To come and build a temple in Jerusalem. And God is warning them? God is saying, give careful thought to your ways. God is saying to them, you guys eat, you guys drink, and you never have your fill. Well, why? What was the problem? Let's go back to verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say... The time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Wow. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? See, here's the crazy thing. These exiles had stepped out on faith. And they had left their homes, their businesses, their property in Babylon. Never to return to it. They had, in a sense, given up everything in order to go back to Jerusalem and to build the temple of God and to do the Lord's work. But they get to Jerusalem. They begin to build. And all of a sudden, they're like, we're trying to reconstruct the temple of God, which, like Matt said, Solomon, years, years, and years ago, had built and was bathed in gold. And after a while, they're like, well, I'm building a house for the sovereign God to live in. What about me, though? I mean, it's a nice house. I don't like a house, too. I did leave everything in Babylon to come out here and do the work. I mean, dude, there are other Jews who stayed in Babylon. I mean, yeah, Billy, my next door neighbor, he didn't come. I know. Josh didn't come either. Michael, yeah, what a loser. He didn't come. I actually left everything. And I came here. So, I mean, come on. The worker deserves his wages, y'all. <laughs> and God, through her guys, like, guys, guys, do you think this is the time for you guys to be putting up your paneled houses? Do you think this is the time for you to be seeking comfort, convenience? No. <laughs> says, this is the time to build the Lord's house. This is the time to build the kingdom of God. And so here's his instruction, verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains, bring down timber, and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord God Almighty. Come on. This is what God would say to us. This isn't the time for us to be seeking our own comfort. This is a time for each and every single one of us to go up into the mountain yeah. and to go cut down timber and come on down and build the house of God. Yeah. And you and I know that the Old Testament is but a physical foreshadowing of the spiritual truths that you and I actually get to live in when we come into the New Testament. Right. And so for us, we're not building a physical temple. No. So he's not actually asking us to go get physical timber. 
We're actually building a spiritual temple of God where the foundation is Christ Jesus himself and every single disciple, every single person who makes a a decision to give up everything becomes a spiritual brick that we're putting there on top of the foundation. And so the more disciples we have, the bigger the temple of God, the bigger the kingdom of God, so God himself can dwell in it with his spirit and be honored. Build the Lord's house and gain his trust. Mm. It's on you and me not to sit down comfortably as God forcefully advances his kingdom. As God brings people our way to get baptized. No! It's our time to go into the mountains. To go into the streets. To go into our neighborhoods, our classroom, to look under the tables and find people who are actually going to hear the word of God, who are going to make a decision to also give up everything and become a spiritual soldier, a true disciple of God, and so become a spiritual brick that can be put upon the foundation of Jesus Christ himself, and we can build this house here in the Bay Area. So God will be honored and you will have glory. Build the If you read the rest of Haggai, the people repent and they respond. Just like Matthew read for us in chapter 2, they repent, they rep- they're like, dude, forget this house I'm trying to build. Forget my own financial security. I'm going to build the house of God. And so God sends Haggai to them again and he says, because of your repentance, look at this house you're building. Does it just seem little to you? Does it just seem poor to you? Let me tell you something. The glory of the present house that you guys are building in full repentance, that you are giving the sweat of your brow, you are sacrificing everything to build. The glory of this temple is going to far exceed the glory of the temple that Solomon built that was bathed in gold. And he says, and in this place, I will grant peace because I will dwell amongst you. That's what God wants to do for you and me. God wants us to bring in the timber and that we may look at us and we'll be like, wow, dude, I remember the times when in the old movement, they planted the Fresno church. And when they planted the Fresno church in the old movement, the declaration was made that with the planting of the Fresno church, every single person in the state of California within a two hour radius is within a two hour radius of a sold out discipling church. And so you might look and be like, that boggles my mind. That there were so many sold out disciples in the state of California that every single human being in California at one time was only a two hour radius away from a sold out discipling church. And we're meeting in Burke Hall in SF State. And and, and this is what we've given up everything to do. Wow. The message from God to the exiles through Haggai is the same message to us. It says, look around you. Doesn't this look like rinky dinky? Of course it is. Doesn't it look small to you? Because it is. Yes, we can face the facts, but we face it with faith. We face it through the eyes of God, through the eyes of faith that says that today this might be small. But the glory of the present house that we're building for God is going to far exceed the glory of the past movement. It's going to far exceed even the glory of Solomon's temple. Because in this house, God will dwell, and he will grant us his peace. As I read this, I I, I can't help but think of our brother, Fernando Chavez. Our brother, Fernando Chavez, leads our San Jose region. And Fernando is an incredible man who has a full-time job and a full-time family. He's married with three kids. He's not full-time in the ministry. He has a full-time job, a very demanding job. But he was asked when he lived in Los Angeles that the church in Portland, Oregon needed help. And so, without hesitation, he sells his house, grabs his family, and moves to Portland, Oregon to help the church there make disciples. Mm. Two years into it, he gets a call. We need help here in San Francisco. Mm. And so one more time, sells his home, approves his family. Now, little baby Vivi. And drives down the I-5 all the way to San Francisco so he could train and so he can actually help us. He comes here and Jason tells him, we want you to take over the Spanish-speaking Bible talk. 
And so he takes over that. And God blesses them in that in about three and a half months, they see seven people added to the kingdom of God. A year into it, Jason comes to him again and says, um, we need help in San Jose. We want you to lead it. And so one more time, sells his home, wow. uproots his family, yeah. drives on down to San Jose. <laughs> and he goes to become the regional leader for the San Jose region. Yeah. It's like, here's a man who has made a decision. Yes, I have a full-time job. Yes, I make enough to actually focus on building a paneled house where my girls can play and they can be free and they can actually have some of the things that I didn't get a chance to have when I was growing up. A doting father, access to toys, Disneyland, whatever. But it says, no, this isn't the time for me to build a paneled house. This is the time to build the house of God here in the San Francisco. And I say, Fernando is a man worthy of imitation. Not only that, just this Wednesday at Men's Midweek, God blesses his faith to approve his family one more time to San Jose, and they had two men from the San Jose State University get baptized and added into the kingdom of God. This is how God wishes us to live as his disciples. To be the men and the women who have made a decision that this world is going after their paneled houses. This world is chasing a 401k. This world is chasing a fat bank account. Why? Because that's all they have. Wow. But for us, as the shrewd managers of the property of God, we know that if we do the job that God calls us to do to take care of his property, we have eternity waiting for us. Wow. We have a father on the other side who's waiting to welcome us in and bring in with us all the souls, all the brothers and sisters who we actually helped become disciples. Yeah. And he's going to welcome us all into eternal dwellings. That's what we live for. That's what we're working towards. That's what we sacrifice for. Yeah. Let's close out back in Luke 16. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Back in Luke 16, verse 15, Jesus says to the Pharisees, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and says, Guys, you are the ones who... Who are trying to justify yourselves in the eyes of men. You are standing here as religious leaders, but your master is not God. Your master is actually money. You're doing this for financial security, but God knows your heart. And this thing that you're able to rationalize, this life that you're living, which is valued among men, is detestable before God. All the striving that the Pharisees were doing to secure their financial future, says it's detestable before God. All the time they were doing, instead of sacrificing for God and building God's kingdom and saving souls of men, but actually looking at themselves and trying to take care of themselves, he says, it's detestable before God. Because let me tell you something. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until the time of John the Baptist that you guys imprisoned and beheaded. But since that time, with the advent of Jesus and his ministry, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and people are forcing their way into it. Wow. And you Pharisees are standing there sneering at me. People are looking at the kingdom of God and they see the value because they see through the eyes of God. Wow. And they are forcing themselves into it. You will stand here and you will sneer. And the day will come when God actually settles accounts with you. And all those who run past you to force your way, their way into the kingdom will stand. And that time, you will not sneer, but you will be sneered at. That is what Jesus wanted to say to the Pharisees. The men who thought they had made it when it came to finances or when it came to devotion to God. Even Paul himself said, dude, up to legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. The Pharisees were men who could quote the Old Testament scriptures. They were men who were like, dude, 
Try to find fault in my life. And you wouldn't be able to find it. Jesus says to them, your master is not God. It's actually your own stomach. It's your own comfort. It's your own leisure. It's your own lives. And so you sneer at God's kingdom today. But a time will come when you will be sneered at. You and I get a chance to behold God's kingdom. This is it. It's the soul of every man in whom the spirit of God dwells. It's the soul of every woman who made a decision to give up everything and to follow Christ. And so God set his seal of ownership on them. And all we're doing as we await the account we're going to give to God is to try and rescue as many people as possible. Mm-hmm. So God says, the world might sneer at you guys. The world might look at you on a Sunday morning, dressed in your Sunday best, trying to flock into Burke Hall 28, and they're sneering at you. The world might look at you, that you're driving and, and you're spending your time trying to stay in the Bible with people, and they might sneer at you. Mm-hmm. But God smiles upon you. Just like the master did with his shrewd manager, he's going to commend you. Mm. On that day when you can stand before God and say, God, here I am. And here are all the souls who Jesus died for and whose debts, whose sins, I had the pleasure of canceling. That's what we're looking forward to. Mm -hmm. In closing, Jesus would have us understand that these are the words that he wants to speak to us. The scriptures teach that Jesus didn't teach the crowds anything without using a parable. But whenever he was with his disciples, he disclosed everything to them. Today, Jesus is disclosing to us this parable of the shrewd manager. And he's telling us, look at the actions of this man. This man who understood that his life was short. This man who understood that once his job was taken, there was life still to come. And he canceled the debts of the debtors of his masters. He says, do the same. Make your life all about canceling people's debts. Don't be the person who's trying to amass friends on Facebook. Amass friends and save their souls for eternal dwellings. Don't be the person who looks at God's house and sneers at it because you're involved in building your own career. You're involved in building your own financial stability. Be a person who says, I'm going to turn my back on the world and I'm going to build God's house. For in then, I will gain the master's trust. The encouraging thing is that we're here in this room because we are the people who made a decision that we're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to suffer whatever it takes. We're going to sacrifice whatever it takes to build God's house. And so God looks upon us and he commends us. And what he would say is, keep working. What he'd say is, keep trucking. What he'll say is, keep paying the price. Because Jesus already paid the final price. He laid his life on the ground. He canceled people's debts. But go into your cities, go into your towns, go into your communities, and tell them that their debts have been paid and canceled their debts. So they too may join you in eternal dwellings and to God. Glory.